Beloved, I believe I speak for all the fathers in the room. When I say that for us, there's nothing that compares to the joy of being a father. It's, it's a blessing to be able to pour into and watch my children grow, to be there to celebrate their accomplishments and to correct and guide them along the way, to teach them skills and watch them develop their own interests, and to know that although I'm really Clark Kent, In their eyes, I'm a superhero who can leap over buildings in a single bound. There's nothing like being a dad. Although being a father is very rewarding, I must be honest this morning and tell you that being a dad is also challenging. See, I have the privilege of fathering two daughters, Kennedy, who's 10, and Carrington, who's five. And throughout my time of being a parent, I had to learn firsthand some of the hard lessons about fathering. See, the first lesson I had to learn is that fathering requires effort. See, there's a certain bond that a child has with their mother that I would argue begins in the womb a love and connection so strong that when children are born, they instinctively cling to their mother. That, that's why when you were younger, uh, somebody could talk trash about your daddy. <laughs> but the moment you say, yo mama, <laughs> some furniture was finna be moving around somewhere. But what I learned is that as a dad, uh, I had to learn that although I inherited the title of father, that ultimately effort was required to build the bond and relationship between me and my girls. I quickly realized that my consistent presence in their life was what mattered most. I, I realized that not only do they need it, uh, to see me, but they had to hear my voice as well. Because the first person that should validate the mind, effort, and beauty of all of our children should be their dad. Another lesson I quickly learned was that uh, uh, actions speak louder than words. See, because our children watch everything we do, and I do mean everything we do, I had to learn that ultimately, if I teach my daughters the importance of being patient, right. I had to exemplify patience too. If I'm going to teach them about kindness, then I too had to show kindness to others. If I teach them about being involved in their community and being responsible citizens, at some point, they should see me volunteering in my community. They should see me voting at the polls or at least wearing the little sticker that they give you afterward. And that if I'm going to teach them about God and having faith in him, then at some point they would need to see or hear me praying. They would have to see me reading my Bible and they would have to experience some outward expression of my inward confession and love for God because it's our actions that speak louder than words. I learned that fathering requires effort, that actions speak louder than words. But lastly, I had to learn to discern moments when they needed intimacy rather than intervention. Right. That there are some moments when I watched my daughters struggle with something and immediately wanted to jump in. As fathers, we are naturally designed to protect our children because no parent wants to see their children suffer and struggle under the weight of something that you know you have the power to alleviate them from. But I had to learn that sometimes as a father, my haste to intervene too quickly would rob them of an opportunity to learn and grow. 
And so I had to realize that in those moments, as long as I remained close to them, eventually I would know when my involvement was necessary. In, in, in fact, I was reminded of this the other day when my girls and I went to the grocery store. We went to the grocery store to get some food for dinner and as we were preparing to bag the groceries and leave out the store, my girl said, Daddy, can we take the bags to the car? I, I, I know my, my oldest daughter, Kennedy, is strong and so I, I, I know that she can carry the weight of the bags and so I gave her some bags and she started walking across the parking lot to the car. But baby girl, she, you know, she want to get involved too. And she said, Daddy, I, I want to carry that bag right there. Now, I, I, I know my daughter has uh, some strength to her. But, but what I didn't know is how long she could carry that bag and how far she could carry that weight. And I gave her the bag and, and she started walking with it. And I noticed that she started struggling with it as she was making her way through the parking lot to the car. And, and, and I offered to take the bag from her. I, I offered for her to, I offered to alleviate her of the weight of the bag, but, but because she's somewhat stubborn like her, like, 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 like her father. She's somewhat stubborn like me. She wasn't able to recognize that it was time to place it in my hands. As I watched her struggle under the weight of that bag, I couldn't help but to think how many of us are silent struggling? How many of us are silently carrying things that are weighing us down? Silently carrying the weight of something. And God is walking next to you, waiting for you to place it in his hands because what I found out is that if you live life long enough sooner or later life will cause you to carry some stuff that will weigh you down am I talking to anybody in here sometimes life can happen in such a way that you feel weighed down some of us are living under the weight of concern for how that thing is going to turn out some of us are living under the weight of the grief and pain of what we lost. Some of us are experiencing the weight of the anxiety for how you are going to make it and how that thing is going to turn out. Some of us are living under the weight because of a relationship that has caused a void with no signs or hope of being resolved. And I'm simply here to tell you this morning, the simple word and truth of this text is that it's time to place it hey, in the Father's hands. I thought I would had a couple more amens than that. I, I said, when it is that you're carrying something heavy that has weighed you down, God is saying it's time to place it in my hands. Now, now, I'm, I'm, I must tell you uh, that, that although we may find ourselves carrying weight. I, I got to clarify this uh, because not all weight is bad weight. In fact, weight by itself is not inherently harmful. Uh, th th there are those of us uh, that, that exercise uh, or need to <laughs> that know that weight can actually improve your health and strength. That, that a, a necessary amount of weight makes you stronger, makes you more agile, and can improve your mental and physical health. So how do you know it's time to let it go? When do you know it's time to place it in the Father's hands? Well, my brothers and sisters, that's what draws us to this text this morning where we find ourselves at the familiar scene of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. 
because you read your Bible and went to Sunday school, you know that at the time of our text, Jesus is nearing the last moments of his physical life. He has already been betrayed by Judas. He's already been arrested by the Sanhedrin council. And in fact, after being arrested, Jesus is taken in front of Caiaphas, the high priest, and found guilty of blasphemy. And although he was found guilty, the Sanhedrin council knew that in order to have Jesus killed, it required the authorization of the occupying Roman government. So Jesus is then taken before Pontius Pilate, a Roman who's the governor of the region. After Pilate speaks to Jesus, Pilate determines uh, that there's not really enough evidence to execute Jesus. Uh, but because Pilate didn't want an insurrection. Uh, because Pilate didn't want another January 6th. He appeases the crowd by exchanging Jesus with Barabbas. And the Bible says that Jesus was flogged and hung on the cross. And there's some debate around how long Jesus' crucifixion was, but generally scholars suggest that from about 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., Jesus hung on the cross. That for six hours, Jesus hung on the cross. For six hours, he endured the pain. For six hours, he carried the weight and shame of our sins. And by the time you get to verse 44, Luke records that Jesus' last and final words were heard him shouting an excerpt from Psalm 31.5 that says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In my time of study, I had to ask the Lord, how did you know that after holding on to that weight for so long, after bearing that weight of our shame and sin for so long, how did you know it was time to put it in the Father's hand? Well, I, I heard Jesus say a few things that I'm going to just share with you so y'all can get the grills started. I, J Jesus said, first, I, I, I knew it was time to place it in the Father's hand because number one, the day had grown dark. The day had grown dark. Verse 44 says that uh, as Jesus hung on the cross, there was a darkness that came above the scene. And in fact, the darkness started at about noon and lasted until about three. And that the light from the sun was gone. What is so important about this darkness? Well, well, if I could tell you about this darkness, uh, the first thing I, I need to tell you is that this darkness was a sign of the people's sinfulness. The darkness was a, symbol, a symbolism of the sin and shame of the crucifixion they were living in a dark day sounds familiar to me because when I looked at that and thought about it I immediately thought about how we too are living in dark days many of us know that darkness the darkness of our day is seen when we prioritize militarism over mental health. We're, we're living in a dark day. When we care more about our social media following than we do about the growing homeless population, it's a sign that we're living in a dark day. When innocent lives are lost as a result of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's a sign that we're living in a dark day. 
when the Supreme Court can authorize bump stocks to be placed on rifles but not uphold a woman's agency over her own body it's a sign that we're living in a dark day when convicted felons in our community are restricted from voting yet a convicted felon is still on the ballot to be the president of these yet to be United States it's a sign that we're living in a dark day now, the darkness the darkness was a sign of the people's sin but also the darkness was a sign uh, 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 it, it was it was sudden it was sudden it was a sudden darkening of the Sun ah the Bible says that from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. Jesus hangs on the cross but the darkness doesn't come till noon which lets me know that from 9 a.m. to 12 noon there was no darkness the sun was shining the 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 day seemed normal yeah there was a crucifixion going on but the sky hadn't changed yet and some of us know something about the suddenness about darkness where you've woken up in the morning at nine o'clock the sun was shining you went throughout your day and got down to 10 a.m. and the sun was still shining deep there was a breeze going through your hair around 11 o'clock but all of a sudden darkness enters our life do you know about the suddenness of darkness have you ever been there when 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 something happened so sudden that that you didn't even have time to gather yourself it it, it happened so unexpectedly the phone call that someone gave you the the the, the doctor's diagnosis the the notice in the mail the unexpected accident because life can sometimes happen in such a way that you didn't expect it you didn't have time to plan for it and you never saw it coming that it can be a sudden darkness that comes into our life I'm reminded of my daughter Kennedy when my, my, when she was younger she was deathly afraid of the dark and I can remember one time uh, I had cut the lights off going up the steps and she screamed out and said daddy I don't like the dark I turned the lights back on and I ran down and grabbed her hand and walked back up the steps with her and as I was walking up the steps I hit the light again but this time I turned to her I said baby I'm sorry I didn't mean to put you in darkness she said so no, no daddy it's fine now because I'm holding on to your hand and and and, and friends whenever you experience the darkening of your day whether due to the sinfulness of people or the suddenness of life Jesus is saying that's when you know you got to place it in your father's hands I, I, I believe that the saints of old knew this when they said I don't know about tomorrow I just live from day to day I don't borrow from its sunshine for its skies may turn to gray I don't worry about the future for I know what Jesus said and today I walk beside him for he knows what is ahead many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand my grandmother she just passed and, and this is her birthday she would tell me that time is filled with swift transition that none on earth unmoved can stand but build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand uh, G G Jesus said I, I knew to place it in the father's hand uh, because the day had grown dark but Jesus then says he says not not only did I place it in his hands because the day was dark but I also placed it in his hands because the veil had been divided the veil had been divided text 45 uh, sorry in the verse 45 it says that that uh, the curtain or the veil in the temple had been rent or split down the middle while Jesus 
was on the cross. Now, the question you should be asking yourself is this. What was significant about the veil being divided? Well, in order, in order for me to tell you that, I got to explain to you the design of the temple. See, the temple was built with really three courtyards. There was the courts for all people, the Jews and the Gentiles. And inside of that, there was what's called the holy place. The holy place was reserved for just the priests. It's where sacrifices were prepared to be burnt and offered unto God. But inside of the holy place was a smaller area called the holies of holies. It's, it's the place where, where not nobody could go except for the high priest. And he could only go on one day out the year. On the day of atonement. Uh, uh, and inside of the holies of holies, uh, there was the Ark of the Covenant and it was God's presence and what separated the holy place from the holies of holies was the curtain or the veil and in, 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 in other words the veil was there to close off the holies of holiness from view but it also symbolically controlled access to God but when Jesus was on the cross hey the veil was split it opened up the veil and allowed access to God uh, in, in fact Paul talks about this in Hebrews where he says now we can enter the holiest with boldness because of the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil by his flesh uh, the, the veil being divided signified that Jesus had completed all his work he did everything that God had required for him to do there was no more blinded eyes for him to open there were no more deaf ears for him to heal that Jesus Jesus completed his work once and for all. And Jesus said, I know that it's time to place it in the Father's hands because I did everything that God had asked me to do. And can I tell you, beloved, when you know it's time to place it in the Father's hands, it's when you've done everything that you can do. When you've said everything that needed to be said, when you cried all the tears that you could cry, when you pleaded and tried and done your best, when you did everything that God had asked you to do for that thing, when you prayed about it and prayed about it and prayed about it and then went to the interview, when you've done everything you can, God is saying, now put it in my hands and allow me to take it. Hey! Put it in God's hands. You've done everything you can. You've done the natural. And God is saying, let me do the supernatural. Put it in his hands. Hey. Ah. I got to let you go. He says, Jesus said, I, I knew to place it in God's hands because the day had grown dark. I knew to place it in his hands because the veil had been divided. But lastly, Jesus says, uh, I, I knew to place it in his hands because I was deeply distressed. I was deeply distressed. My brothers and sisters, Jesus was wrongly convicted and sentenced to crucifixion on the cross. I think I need to let you know it was a bloody crucifixion. Before even being placed on the cross, Jesus was flogged. That's, that's, a, that's a nice way of saying it. They beat Jesus. The Romans had, had perfected torture. 
they knew how to beat a person and inflict the immense or intense or the maximum amount of pain while still keeping the person alive. It was a bloody crucifixion. Jesus first had to take 39 lashes with something akin to a cat of nine tails. It's, it's a tool or weapon uniquely designed to tear the flesh and cause immense pain. It was a bloody crucifixion. After being whipped over his entire backside and down his legs, he was forced to carry the post of the cross, which scholars suggest weighed no less than 150 pounds. He had to put it upon his tattered body. It was a bloody crucifixion. He was forced to drag that cross down the Via Dolorosa, a long path that stretched about 600 meters or 2,000 feet. It was a bloody crucifixion. After making it to Calvary, they placed nails in his hands, nails in his feet. They forced a crown of thorns through his flesh. In fact, the thorns of that region were so long that when forced upon the head, they would break through the skin and scrape the skull. It was a bloody crucifixion. They, host, they hoisted him up on that cross, which was designed to dislocate the shoulders and make it difficult for him to breathe. In fact, in order for Jesus to simply take a breath, and expand his lungs he would have to pull up on the nails of his hands and push down on the nails in his feet and drag his exposed back along the splintered wood of that cross it was a bloody crucifixion and by the end of that hour I can only imagine how Jesus said I am deeply distressed what I didn't tell you about my daughters at that grocery store is that when we got home now that we got the groceries in the car we got to take them into the house I gave Kennedy her bag she hopped out the car all strong self she hopped out the car ran into the house but I looked back at Carrington and Carrington I gave her her bag but her arms flopped she looked at me, she said, Daddy, I'm weak. She, she, she implored something that my wife taught her to do. My, my wife taught my daughters to listen to your body. And she said, Daddy, my body's telling me that I can't carry this no more. That I, I, I've reached a point that I've ran out of strength. I had strength at the store. I had strength in the parking lot. I had strength coming to the car but now that we're at home and now that it's time to pick this weight back up I am distressed and I'm too weak and my brothers and sisters what I simply want to tell you is that when you've reached the point of your strength when you've reached the point where you're saying God I'm distressed that's the point where you gotta say father I stretch my hands to thee no other help I know that if thou withdraw thyself from thee, wherever shall I go? I'm done. But, but Jesus placed it in the Father's hand because the day had grown dark. He placed it in his hands because the veil had been divided. Uh, he placed it in his hands because he was deeply distressed. But I had to ask Jesus just one more question. How did you know to put it in the Father's hands? And he said, well, that's simple. He said, I put it in his hands because his hands are divine. He said, I knew that I could trust his hands because his hands had never failed me before. And I know his hands won't ever fail me since. The Bible says that, that, that you can trust his hands. In fact, I heard that at the beginning of time, it was his 
that stood over the edge of darkness. In fact, the Bible says that it was the Father's hands that laid the foundation of the earth and spread out the heavens, that it was His hands that the Father put the stars in the sky and wrote down their name, that God told Isaiah, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with the righteousness of my right hand. Uh, David said that God's hands are mighty and his love endureth forever. In fact, in 1 Peter it says, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hands, because in due time, he will lift you up. And so my brothers and sisters, God bless you, but when it's dark in your life, put it in the Father's hands. That when you've done all you can do, place it in the Father's hands. And when your body gets weak, place it in the Father's hands. When I was younger, I, w I was in uh, Bible study. I was in Sunday school, and I asked Sister Ann Netherland, I said, how big are God's hands, and how strong are they? She said, well, baby, I can't give you a real answer. She said, nobody really knows how big his hands are, nor how strong they are. But she said, here's a song for you, and hopefully that'll help you along the way. And she said, he's got the whole world in his hands do I have a witness in the room he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands do I have a witness in the room that can testify I'll place it in his hands because he can hold my stress I'll place it in his hands because he can hold my anxiety I'll place it in his hands because he can hold my fear I'll place it in his hands because he'll give me strength I'll place it in his hands because he'll give me peace I'll place it hey I'll place it when it's dark in your life. Sometimes we just got to go to God. When you've done all that you can do, you can't do no more. <laughs> Place it in the sand. And when you feel weak, and you can't go no further, place it in his hands he's a God who's eagerly waiting give it to me I'll take the weight 